Welcome and thank you for standing by for today's conference. All participants will be in the answer session. At that time to ask a question, please press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Mike Walsh. Sir, you may begin. Thank you. Welcome to virtual job fair. We are happy to see you all here and we hope to engage you in the many opportunities we have for public service careers. Before we move forward, we want to take a moment to identify the rules of engagement for today's event. During the event and after the event, we will have a team of HR professionals that will be manning the email adrm.job.fair at census.gov. That is at the bottom of each of the introductory screens during this presentation. If you would like to direct any question to any one of our presenters, questions about any of the positions, or if you would like further details, please use this email as provided. If time allows, there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation where we will attempt to answer questions via the moderator. More information on that will follow during the presentation. Here is a brief message from our research and methodology alumnus and acting director, Ron Jarman. Next slide. Hello everyone, I'm Ron Jarman, Acting Director. I'd like to welcome you all to our first ever virtual job fair. I hope to inspire you to come work up here at the U.S. Census Bureau. I've spent my entire career right here at the Census Bureau since starting as an economist straight out of grad school. And it has been a privilege to work with the dedicated staff that make up this break. Our mission is to serve as a provider of quality data about its people and economy. Our goal is to provide the best use of timeliness, relevancy, quality, and cost for the data we accept and the services we provide. And everyone here at the HC has a role to play. Whether you're a statistician, demographer, or a geographer working on one of our next surveys, a field representative working at the National Processing Center, or an IT specialist working right here at headquarters, every job is important. Our robust knowledge sharing with the community is one of the kind and we work together and learn from one another along the way. We are a diverse group of people, and we thrive when we bring our different ideas to the community. And as public servants, we help ensure the success of our country. I hope you all learn about the benefits that come with working at the Census Bureau and how proud we are of the work that we do. Take a look around the amazing jobs we posted online, and I hope you bring your talent to join our team. Thank you. Thank you for your message and for your service, Ron. We appreciate all that you do for the Census community. Next to the screen is the Census Bureau's Assistant Director of Research and Methodology, John Elting. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. And um, thanks also to Ron Jarman for his introduction um, we had a moment ago. Uh, recapping and extending some of the comments we've heard from both Mike and from Ron, we're absolutely delighted that all of you are having the opportunity to participate in this job fair today. Highlight a couple of points that we're especially excited about and want to be share, sure to share uh, with all of you. Uh, first is that in carrying out work uh, related to gathering and then producing, disseminating information about the American people and the American economy, there are incredibly rich classes of technical challenges that we deal with every day. And that's the reason we're having this job fair, because we have many of those uh, opportunities to carry out that work, and we have a lot of opportunities for uh, bringing additional colleagues in to work on those challenges. Uh, second, as Mike was mentioning a moment ago, we also have a very important component of public service, and many, many of us uh, here uh, are so excited about the work that we have and the opportunity to do this very com complex technical work um, in service to the American public, helping everybody understand, again, both the American people and the American economy. So look forward very much to uh, hearing all of your questions, as well as hearing all the presentations we'll have over the next uh, several minutes. With that, we'll turn things back to Mike. Thank you, John. And a uh, quick point of order, just to remind people that the chat is turned off during this presentation. Um, there is an email that is available at the bottom of the screen, an introduction of each speaker that is uh, 
the adrm.job.fair at census.gov, and we have a team of people set there to respond to any of the questions. Uh, we will also have a question and answer period towards the end. If you can stay, we would be more, we would be more than happy to entertain your questions. Uh, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Census's Chief Data Officer, Zach Whitman. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, John. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, okay, so great. Um, I am representing SUDSI right now, the Center for Enterprise Dissemination Services and Consumer Innovation. This is a long acronym that I will be quizzing everyone at the end of the call about. Um, we are focused on dissemination, how we can bring more value to the public, and how can we broaden uh, people's understanding of the data that we have. It's a common challenge that we understand that when folks think about the Census Bureau, they don't necessarily think about the full breadth of the data that we release. We are not simply a decennial-centric service. We provide information about people and economy, and we have surveys running in parallel throughout the year, throughout the decade, and over multiple uh, uh, vintages of time. And, and, and the amount of tangible value that we can provide back to that to the public is, is enormous, not only through grants and not only through public policy, but also through individuals making life decisions about where they want to live or small businesses thinking about where they want to open up uh, a new brick and mortar. And, and, and that, that challenge is really exciting. And, and what you'll find here with us is that we're very mission-centric. We, we really truly believe that, the, that there is power in open data uh, to impact people's daily life. We believe that there's that tangible method to allow folks to make more informed decisions through the data rather than uh, have to go to somewhere else or making some sort of uh, best guess estimate. Can we provide better information for folks um, uh, for their for their for their for their daily decisions? Uh, Rena, can we go to the next slide, please? So our vision for this dissemination team, SEDSI, uh, is to inspire folks to use open data to sh to let the data demonstrate its value to the end user, uh, and that includes to the government, to businesses, to communities. It's it's a general, very wide uh, customer base that we have, which is an opportunity in that space. We are not solely focused on delivering data to Congress or, uh, or to specific governmental organizations or to specific businesses or to communities. We have this very large remit where we need to, we need to support all of these areas. And, and that, 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 that vision of being able to do that is one that is obviously very technically complicated. There's a ton of technical issues that we uh, see as opportunities to improve our services, uh, not just to make them available, but to make them uh, a joy to use. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so why are we here? So SEDSI, the idea that we consolidate our dissemination activities was born out of the fact that over time we've seen a organic development of different ways to disseminate information. Like I said, the census does far more than just the decennial. We have several uh, hundreds of unique surveys running in parallel, overlapping, uh, oftentimes uh, can be introdu introducing the same frame to the same folks. And so we have a, a very complicated amount of data that we are releasing. And as a result, what we found over time was that we developed individual applications or conduits for folks to access data depending on the use case. So for certain users that we understood that are more casual, just want to understand a little bit more about their community, we built applications that were tailored to that use case. And on the other hand, we have some more uh, technical uh, users that want to only consume data through the API or more programmatic users that understand the data through the FTP. Regardless of that mode, though, individual ways and mechanisms for the data to reach those places. The, uh, the program areas, the, the areas responsible for providing that data, we're doing it individually to each application, which obviously lends itself to a couple of issues, right? The, the first one being that that's a lot of work, and oftentimes you're seeing duplicative work because the same data might be going into four or five different applications at once. Choose because the ETL requirements for each one of those areas might be different. And so you can see potential issues with data consistency between the applications. Furthermore, a lot of these applications were built differently. And so you can have different update cycles, different methods. Some were waterfall, some were a little bit more agile. And sometimes the code 
and the data were intrinsically linked. So I could not update the data without updating the code or vice versa, which again led to a bit of an issue because when the data are released and, we'll, and when they're made available to that application, that can introduce a gap in time and that can introduce confusion if one user goes to two applications that say two different things, it's a consistency problem and that's something that we, we are looking to resolve. So there have been five main areas that we are tackling that are hoping to address this issue. Uh, the first one is we need to establish consistent governance across the enterprise so that no matter what program area you're coming from and what application you're going to, we have we want to establish metadata standards. They're, they're critical because we understand that users would like to see data combined with one another. And we can't do that without strong metadata standards. You think about specific keys like geography. I want to think about a place. I want to understand some demographic area, demographic data about that place. I need a way to combine that information. And this is a really big technical challenge because we have a lot of history behind these surveys. We also need to establish one consistent data platform, meaning all the data is coming from particular data store or series of stores that have been consolidated from the program area rather than having the program area deliver data to individual stores, which can get out of sync. We need to consolidate this and then build services that address the specific requirements of each application that's providing services to. to. Um, we also need to simplify the data discovery, access, and consumption. It's a really fun problem, but it's also probably the hardest. The, our data is very technical. It's oftentimes laden with specific jargon or vernacular that is specific to specific domains, making it really hard for users to translate between surveys or programs or even data sets. We need to figure out a way that abstracts that confusion away from the user and provide uh, synonyms, entity recognition, and allow for relational mapping between these ideas so that we can get folks to the data uh, efficiently. The more data we add to a system does not inherently make the system better. It sometimes can make it harder to find the thing that you're looking for. So it's, that's one of the biggest challenges that we're working on. And then lastly, we want to be responsive to the public. We, we need to be able to respond to the needs of the public rather than continuing to do things the way in which they've always been done because they've been done that way is something that we're moving away from. We want the requirements, not only for the applications or the data services, but also for the surveys themselves. We think that the more value users can see with the data that they get from the census, the more likely they will be to participate in future surveys or censuses. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So our target is to inverse everything. Consistent, one, singular direction from the program area to this platform that we're establishing into a consolidated service set that provides support for different applications. First party, things like data.census.gov, a recent initiative, but also the idea that our services could be used for anyone across the industry, someone who wants to build their own version of an application that disseminates some specific part of our data or combines it with other stuff is, is something we want to enable. We can only do so much in our remit. However, if we can build a system that enables others to build on top of that, we've been able to see that data diffuse further out into the general public's awareness of the data and the availability of that data ultimately hoping that they can make more. Uh, by 2023, and then we've set a few targets to, to make sure that we can get there, and it's a really big task. So we've set a 10-year window for this vision to be achieved. By 2023, what we're looking for is to create this data platform that can serve as the consolidated uh, service endpoint for the, the different applications established and it begun to enforce these data standards so that we can start to see interoperability introduced into the data sets that we currently have into the platform. And by 2027, we want to be able to deprecate or uh, re in suite that exists for data dissemination. So all the different data dissemination applications that we saw in that chart or that little visualization in the slide previously, 
we'd like to replace those or at least re-engineer them so that they're all at the very least pulling from a singular data source, ideally pulling uh, principles as well so that users can translate ideas between the applications. But the key part is pulling from a singular uh, data source. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so how are we going to do this? It's a big task. We're talking about loading a ton of data into a system, and then we're talking about building or refactoring a ton of Our position is that we need to do this through standardization and then providing documentation about how data are accessed, how the data are structured, and, um, and then provide support services on top of those APIs, the idea being that Right now, our API is, 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 is structured hierarchical based on the provider, based on the vintage. It's a number of terms that you would have to know as a developer to find a, a specific piece of data. There's no clear search service on top of all of these data sets. So you couldn't really drill into different data that would help you find the thing that you're looking for. So we want to put in our uh, our business logic into the service itself. So you can ask direct queries of the database rather than it being um, literally structured not know or be familiar with. So our idea is that everything derives from this API. We build intelligence into that API, abstracting the access layer outside of that so you have discovery metadata associated with that data. And then ultimately allowing for users to browse this both in clear open API specification documentation, but also through an interface that would allow you to view the data and actually work with it. Not everyone's a developer, and we also know that developers do like GUIs from time to time. It can help you explore what you're looking for, and so we, we understand that we need to have a two-pronged approach here. But importantly, we want to make sure that the any, any application that we build is a thin client or as thin as possible. We want to remove intelligence, all that business logic about what data set you use depending on the time, depending on the geography. We want to abstract that away and bake that into the service architecture so that a third party building an application on top of these APIs would have a fighting chance of building a robust uh, application that also is relying on the correct data source a lot of overlapping information, and deciding what data source you use is, is, a, is a challenge that Google, Microsoft, uh, Amazon all struggle with. We've talked to them directly, and the business intelligence, the confusion about what data source to use provide, that we'd like to provide in these API services. Um, all the applications we're looking to build through a specification, so instead of building everything from scratch. We understand a lot of these data applications are some combination of a map, a table, and a chart. Unique interface, but they usually are composite of those three ideas. Those three ideas we've already engineered to a degree in data.census.gov. So what we're thinking is instead of always reinventing the wheel, let's reuse some of these common components through a templatized design and allow for these dynamic applications to spin up, spin down. Can we go to the next slide, please? So for our roadmap, um, again, this is kind of a, a little bit more generic for what we're talking about in terms of that those vision statements, but with some clear technical outcomes that we're looking for. Um, we, we we are looking at refactoring our, our hosting services. Now, this is not a foregone conclusion. This is something that we want. We want to pursue the best tech. We don't want to pursue cloud because it's being told or it's, it's a directive or it, you know, we read about this and this is important. No, it, it's about the, making sure that we build the right system and we think that based on the ways in which folks access the data, we have a scale up, scale down question that probably lends itself to cloud. There's also really interesting work that's being done in a lot of these cloud services that we can in, either in-house or rely on in the cloud. So the cloud looking at right now. Um, we're also looking at a re-architecture of the current system. We have a lot of legacy systems that we've been cobbling together. We'd like to start to think about how can we refactor this for the modern use cases and not rely on the existing systems 
unless they are meeting the technical requirements that we need. We're also looking at that strong governance model. So uh, trying to engineering our, our way out of the strong metadata standards across the enterprise. We, we can only scale up so much with unique data elements coming in from different data providers. To handle the true scale of the problem, we're looking at strong uh, standards uh, for both our data onboarding process as well as our display processes. Uh, the metadata standardization uh, follows in with that strong governance model, making sure that we can enforce all of these standards. And then finally, uh, a, a sustainable expansion um, into other ideas. There's a lot of really interesting would like to pursue, um, those being, uh, you know, thinking about like dynamic workbooks for folks to come in and collaborate with the data directly, looking at how the interface looks between a tabulated service and a microdata service. There's a lot of really fun, really cutting edge ideas that we'd like to get to. Um, and, and doing that sustainably is, is part of that, that ultimate goal. If, if we can set the groundwork for a build process, then we can start to get creative and, and have even more fun than, than what we're currently doing. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so how does this fit into hiring? Well, an application architect, Following me will be Richie, uh, who is our, our chief architect, and then Shauna, who is the lead in our operations area. Um, they will go into a few other positions, but at, at the, the base level, we're looking for uh, an application architect, someone to help us uh, connect the place and, and, and make sure that we're, we're addressing this through the right technical decisions, um, defining that roadmap of how we get from, from our initial state, our current state, to that that end goal with those key uh, visions in, in mind, um, both metadata but, and data, but also geospatial data and, and its metadata. I think that's something that we, call, we, we overlook. So someone with, with uh, a geospatial experience would be an absolute um, uh, bonus because there's a heavy dependency on our geospatial information and how it, how it works with our, with our data. Um, I can go into more detail, and I think this would probably serve better in the, in the question and answer period, but um, uh, I'd like to keep the ball rolling so I can get it over to Richie uh, as soon as possible. So can we go to the next slide? So for the skills, um, we're, we're again, we're looking for someone with an advanced degree in, in CompSci, uh, five plus years of software engineering, and three in data analytics and automation. Um, there is a heavy will be in um, trying to understand our use case and then automating it away. And a lot of that will be ML or AI based. Uh, there, there is a, a natural progression into that space. Um, and so we're, we're looking for someone with a bit of experience there. Um, we're also looking for open source as a first policy. We, we want the open source solution architecture more so than any kind of proprietary GOTS, COP products. Um, we, we truly believe in the open source community and we want to be a big part of this. Right now we have a combination of, of closed and open source stuff, uh, Oracle DBMS being the most um, uh, specific one in our stack, but we also have additional stuff. But again, a uh, strong balance between uh, data, ge uh, metadata, and then the geospatial aspect is, is, a, is a key part of that. And, and uh, we'll get into a little bit more detail later on, but um, that's uh, those are the basic skills that we're looking for. So these are our core values, um, and we can we can always come back to this during the Q and A. Um, you know, uh, this is reinforcing our set size general um, principles and, and how we organize. Again, we're very mission centric. We all are very of the the data having value to the public. Um, you know, we are uh, strongly apolitical. We believe in delivering as much value, value as possible with as few resources. And we want to also drive a culture of innovation where we can try new ideas and experiment and, and let, the, uh, let the data do a lot of the work. And we just figure out what can we do to bring it closer to our customer? How can we appeal to our customers with these data rather than, um, having the, the customers have to, we want to allow people to 
fall into the data because we, we see that value and we just want to share that, that excitement. If we go to the next slide, I think we go into a few more specifics about this. And I, and I want to leave a lot of these um, points to Richie, but for this year, we're focused on being reliable, being open and transparent, being user-driven, being known, and setting standards and governance. These are not in priority order necessarily, um, but right now it, it, we have been focusing really heavily on being reliable. We are instantiating a brand new system, one that in operations, and so our goal right now is to establish a baseline, something that is functional, and, and as we can we continue to involve that, we can move up the hierarchy of needs here and start to make things um, even better. Uh, so our goal, um, we have taken a back seat on being known, so we've held off on a lot of SEO work. We've held off on a lot of the, uh, the promotional work that would go outside of the normal channels of folks consuming our data. Um, we've, our focus has largely been on establishing this, this platform, making sure people are aware of what we're doing, and then setting those standards and governing. Those, that's laying the groundwork for the metadata standardization. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, and real quick, the last thing for me is our process. Right now, we are in a scaled agile uh, process, and so this is to cut from their book directly. Um, we least train structure that I think a lot of folks will be pretty familiar with. Again, it's relying on safe, so it's very structured. There's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of organizational um, weight behind this. We are a part of a few other strategic initiatives, which are also following the safe method methodology, and so we've inherited this structure, and it's something that we are constantly working with the enterprise on to to uh, continually continually mature and evolve so that it's meeting our needs. Um, effectively, our, our, our thing that we care about most is uh, time from uh, idea to dissemination or, or delivery. So our, our key focus here is um, defining new functionality or uh, improving existing functionality, uh, measuring the time it takes to understand what we're talking about, spec it out, hand it over to its implementation phase, making sure that it's very well tested. Again, we're always trying to move reliability to the left where we are focused on very high quality code that can be tested, testable and validated. Uh, proof of work is a really key focus for us right now. Moving into the deployment process and then uh, managing that um, uh, in its production environment. So our, our release train is, again, shouldn't be anything new. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, I think we're, I've gone way over, so I'm gonna stop here pass it over to Richie, who is going to talk about uh, the development area and what his key focuses are. So thanks, everyone, and I look forward to the questions later. All right. Uh, thank you, Zach. My name is Richie Wong. I'm the Assistant Center Chief for Dissemination Development and Technical Integration. And just like Zach said earlier, most of our titles are extremely long. Uh, so next slide. Um, our brand, uh, the way we're organized is, or my area is organized, is we're broken up into three different branches, the development branch, uh, the DevOps branch, as well as infrastructure and security. So what the development branch is responsible for is the user interface, services and search, as well as software approvals, development um, standards and process, as well as policies for uh, code promotion. The DevOps branch, what they're primarily responsible for is enabling development to deploy faster, as well as uh, testing strategies and framework to ensure that we have good quality with our code. Infrastructure and security, what they're primarily focused on is making sure they're providing the hardware, software support, and account management needed, as well as security best practices to support the promotion of the code. So currently, um, our all of these areas, even though we're broken up into three different branches, they work very collaboratively together. Uh, next slide, please. So this is um, a list of the different software technology stack that we use. Um, we use Eclipse, Java, Vue, Tomcat, Apache, Jenkins, GitLab, these are, and as well as Elk. These are a fairly standard technology stack in, in the in the commercial world today. And there's also 
technology that is not listed um, on here that we also use. So this is definitely not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Currently, for our software product, we support four primary products for SETSI. One of them is data.census.gov, which is the UI for pre-tabulated um, data or aggregate data. The next one is what is referred to as the index API. This is allowing us for search and discovery. The next one is the data API, which uh, is api.census.gov. And the last one is that microdata um, access tool. And this is uh, used for public use microdata. Next slide, please. So uh, our area is looking for developers uh, for the development branch, and we're looking for primarily for UI developers, someone who has worked in Vue, but if you have also worked in Angular or React um, and would like to move towards a different framework, that's also um, something we're looking at as well. For search and service developer, what we're looking for is someone with Java experience or data modeling as well as machine learning and Elasticsearch. The machine learning and Elasticsearch are used primarily for our search services. Next slide, please. For the DevOps area, we're looking for a DevOps engineer to help enable um, developers to be able to promote the code faster through the pipeline. We're in desperate need of finding really good DevOps engineer to help standardize uh, baselines for applications as well as promoting code through the various environment. And for the testing engineer, we're also, we're not looking for someone who just goes in and clicks on the screen, look for errors, but we're looking for programmers who's able to help with the automation process. We would, because we have uh, different products that we're trying to test and we're trying to move the code faster through the pipeline, we're mainly focus on automation. Next slide, please. We're also looking for system and security. So we support 24 seven production operation as well as verifying the system is delivered and configured for each environment as well as coordination with security. All right, next slide, please. All right, uh, with that said, I am going to turn it over to Shauna Orsakowski. Good morning. Uh, my name is Shauna Orsakowski, and I am over the dissemination operations and processing branch. Do you want to move to the next slide? Um, a little bit about what we do in my area. We are pretty much as it says, we are the processing and operations area. We take the data from the data providers, basically the analysts that review and approve the information. Um, we package it up and ship it out externally um, into the UI that's provided by Richie and team. Um, we're specifically more of a uh, operational area. Um, while we're looking for IT and comp sci expertise, we don't really sit at a computer and develop we need very technical people that can communicate between a data analyst, a very non-technical role, with, a, with the technical role of the developers. What are their needs? What fits their needs? Um, what is wrong with the, the way their data is being displayed? Um, that, that sort of operational process. Um, along with very technical skills, we really like communication skills making sure you can do that communication between a technical and a non-technical uh, person. Um, when we say review data and metadata prior to publication, we have to understand that the, the technical specifications that we've provided and that is the, the format is delivered to us and that it's getting interpreted by our systems correctly and displayed public, publicly correct, correctly. We build internal review tools that help the data analysts in the Census Bureau look at the data and say, yes, you're doing with my information what I expect. And we create a process for them to approve it and push it out to the external world for their use. Um, we, we write plans for them. We build schedules for them so they know how our process works and they have a clear time frame. Um, we maintain the public release schedules. We are the area that the data providers say, this is when I can push my data public, and we communicate that out in a schedule so that others know. Um, 
when things go wrong with the data in the display. Like, we don't care if it's pink or purple. What we care about is the data structure is as expected and the data is presented as the data provider approved it. So when, the, when defects show up, we have to troubleshoot them and figure out where the problem is. Is it in our system? Did the data provider give us poor metadata? Um, this requires very good technical skills, very good troubleshooting skills. Testing, um, testing is a huge part of what we do. Being, having testing in your background is very helpful. Um, assisting data providers in loading and reviewing their data and metadata. Again, many of these are very non-technical. They're very good data analysts, but they're not really used to interfacing with a, you know, a technical system. So when they have problems, they need to answer, they need answers to their questions. Why is my metadata incorrect? So you have to understand the whole spectrum of, of the information, um, skills that we're seeking. Uh, currently, we use Oracle as our underlying database, but database skills of any type are helpful. Um, Toad is the tool we use to look at Oracle, but a background in any kind of third-party tool is helpful. Um, our, our method of delivering us data and metadata, uh, the metadata is in XML, the data is uh, straight. ASCII format, um, but understanding XML or something similar, basically being able to read any kind of technical uh, format. Um, our programs are coded in Java, uh, and again, we have a whole system from the way the data is picked up when it's delivered to us and how it's loaded into the system, error handling, all those review processes. Um, again, we follow the Agile software development process for any kind of development we do, but we are an operations shop. We do not follow Agile software for our operational processes because the, we are dependent on the data provider's needs. They need to release their data on a regular time schedule, and so we, we meet that need. Um, so and internal providers. Um, and then when things are reported to us from exter external, we hand that over to an internal shop for help. Um, that's a, in a nutshell my, my area. Um, again, we're looking for strong technical people, not really wanting to sit at a computer and code, but having those technical skills that they're good and communication piece. I'm going to hand this over to Jaya. Good morning, everyone. I am Jaya Damneni, Assistant Center Chief in CODS. Uh, CODS is the Center for Optimization and Data Science. We are part of Research and Methodology Directorate. Uh, uh, can we go to the next slide, Rina? Uh, CODS vision is to advance Census Bureau's research goals by applying and innovating methods and software for data science and providing world-class research computing environments. In CODS, we have like three main branches. Uh, one is software engineering. Uh, we provide software lifecycle support to research projects uh, in this branch. Uh, this includes developing and curating requir requirements, uh, enhancing, maintaining, and curating the project code uh, uh, that is developed by researchers. And we also uh, develop and implement uh, test cases and test um, the production code. Uh, sorry, the research code. Um, the second branch is the data science. Here we perform research on internal and external sponsored surveys to improve data quality and timeliness and decrease cost uh, by applying cutting edge adaptive design methodologies and data science techniques. The third branch is research computing and data management. Um, here we maintain research computing environments for uh, the Bureau. Our research computing environments are both in cloud and on-prem. We have an, we have three uh, environments. Uh, some of them are in cloud and uh, some are on-prem. Uh, we maintain these environments and expand them when needed to meet the demands of uh, uh, the scientific research. Can we go to the next slide? Um, uh, we have multiple vacancies uh, in the software engineering uh, uh, branch. Uh, what we are looking here uh, from the can uh, is uh, candidates who are uh, proficient in software development. The skill sets that uh, uh, we need are Python, R, SAS, Arc, SQL, 
Hadoop, Apache, and Linux. Uh, the great series that is available, um, or we are, the great series that we are looking to hire is GS 11 or 12 and GS 13. Uh, so we are looking for experienced programming, uh, uh, experienced programmers with three years of experience in Python, R, and Spark, and five years of experience um, in SAS, SQL, and Linux. Uh, is any experience in GitHub and Jira is the uh, a bonus. Um, the person who will be hired for this position will work closely with researchers on data science projects to help in creating data sets needed for the research, develop code to perform text mining and machine learning, and uh, test the models developed by the researchers. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, the next position uh, is in uh, uh, the data uh, research computing and data management area of cards. Uh, here we are looking for candidates with experience in software development. Uh, preferable skill sets are uh, Python, R, SAS, uh, Linux, and uh, uh, the one. Uh, and we are also looking for experience in data analysis. Uh, the grade series uh, is, we are looking for is GS12 and GS13. Uh, we are looking for three years of experience in Python and R and five years of experience in SAS and Linux. The person hired for this position will perform um, tasks like uh, ingesting the data into our data warehouse, uh, provisioning the data from the data warehouse to research projects, and curating the data. They also will provide support to users on uh, issues like data access and any questions on the data sets. Uh, they will be needed to develop uh, scripts to automate data transfers, check the data quality on the data sets, and perform data wrangling tasks uh, using SAS, uh, Python, and Linux. They also need to transfer data between uh, uh, the environments on cloud and on-prem. Now I would like to uh, hand it over to Nick Ferris uh, from CES. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is actually Eric Vickstrom. Uh, I'm going to be filling in for Nick today, who got pulled away at the last minute. Uh, I'm the group lead for demographic and decennial research in the demographic research area of CES. And I'm here to talk to you about a uh, computer science opening that we have. Uh, the Center for Economic Studies, also known as CES, uh, partners with stakeholders within and outside of the U.S. Census Bureau to improve measures of the economy and people of the U.S. through research and the development of innovative data products. The staff in CES use Census Bureau microdata, administrative records, and other sources to carry out research that leads to discoveries in the social sciences not possible using publicly available data, improvements in existing products, enhancements to micro-level data sets for researcher use in the Federal Statistical Research Data Center, or FSRDC, network and also new statistics and information products for public use. Uh, CES has four research areas, uh, business re research, demographic research, interdisciplinary research, and uh, the longitudinal employer household dynamics area. Next slide, please. In terms of the de demographic research area uh, that uh, we're here representing today, we are a multidisciplinary research group uh, made up of data scientists, demographers, economists, statisticians, and other staff. The majority of our staff have a PhD and all have at least a master's degree. Uh, our staff are experts in administrative records, research, and utilization. It's, it's really the, the, our main focus. Uh, and we have uh, the current administrative records assets uh, that the census holds. And the approach here is to utilize quantitative statistical methods on large data sources, which requires optimization and coding and data processing, and we're increasingly looking to integrate publicly available and unstructured. Uh, the mission of the demographic research area uh, is to serve as recognized experts on population and housing administrative records research and utilization to 
improve survey and decennial census operations and data products, to create blended data products to fill gaps in Census Bureau data offerings, to act as a key resource in the Census Bureau's administrative records infrastructure, and also to answer important social science research questions. Next slide, please. So here, um, this is about how uh, we do our work by leveraging administrative records across the survey life cycle. Uh, and here, there's, there's just a, a couple things to point out, a couple of highlights um, in terms of something like data collection. Uh, we use multiple data sources, for example, to create sample survey frames so we can, uh, so we can uh, improve the quality of survey data uh, of interest, such as uh, when looking at households with kids. In terms of something like data processing, uh, we use numerous sources to research ways we can potentially replace uh, or supplement items that would appear, appear on a standard uh, survey questionnaire. Uh, and in terms of research, uh, we're doing a lot of work in this area, such as um, uh, an administrative record simulation of the 2020 decennial census, which uses many sources to create um, a, a, a simulation of the decennial count, again, using only administrative records. So, so we really tried to innovate across the survey lifecycle uh, by using uh, administrative records. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, is an example of a visualization that we recently um, uh, pushed out to the Public Facing Census website, uh, which helps um, stakeholders better understand WIC eligibility and uh, participation. Um, so here, uh, you know, this, this is an, an example of some of the recent work we've done in visualizations, but we're certainly hoping to move um, into more visualizations uh, as uh, out to the wider world. Next slide, please. So the um, position that we're uh, looking to fill is a computer scientist position in the demographic research area. It's a GS-13 computer scientist, uh, series 1550 position. Looking for someone here with strong computer programming and data optimization skills. For example, experience wrangling big and messy data, experience developing processes and structures for regularly occurring complex data processing and analysis tasks, and experience capturing and assessing unstructured. In addition, we're looking for uh, people with experience creating data visualizations. And in terms of skill sets, we're, we're, we're open to, to people who have ability to program in Python, R, and other commonly used statistical packages. For example, SAS is a big one that, that we use. Next slide, please. And now, uh, that said, uh, thanks for your time, and I'll hand it over to Ann Johnson. Thanks, Eric. All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Ann Johnson, and I'm the Project Management Lead for the Research and Methodology Directorate at the Census Bureau. Um, so in this virtual environment that we find ourselves in, collaboration tools are more important than ever. And the Research and Methodology Directorate utilizes SharePoint for just that purpose, but we realize that there's a lot more potential for the tool to help create process efficiencies and develop a more modern work experience. Um, the Research and Methodology Directorate is looking for someone with skills in SharePoint to help with the creation, maintenance, and modernization of our directorate site collections. We're teaching a candidate that not only has strong so creative, innovative, and pragmatic. The position offers a unique opportunity for working with many different teams and areas throughout our directorate. Um, next slide, please. So the preferred skills uh, for this uh, SharePoint staff would be experience with SharePoint Online in the 2016 environments, also platform suite including Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power BI. And because these are newer features, uh, any experience building workflows, forms, or, or dashboards in SharePoint is very helpful. So the candidate should also be familiar with uh, SharePoint list library web parts and should also stay up to date on the latest uh, features, functionalities, and um, any updates to the environment. 
since this is a customer focused position, strong communication and, and customer ser service skills are important as well as for um, taking a systematic approach to, to managing the site. And, and coding skills can be very helpful in this role as well. So that's all for my presentation today. Thank you for, for listening. And I will now turn things over to Tiffany, Julissa, and Rena to present. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Good morning. My name is Tiffany Taman. I am an HR liaison. And now that you have more information about our open positions, let's talk about the application process. Thank you. I know this process can seem overwhelming, but all the information that is needed to make the certificate of eligibles or to be referred to the hiring official is in the vacancy announcement. So you want to read through the entire job announcement, including the questions, highlighting your qualifications. Submit all transcripts. If you have more than one, you want to submit them all. If you are a current federal employee, please submit your most recent SF-50 that will be needed in order to qualify you for a cover letters. This is optional, but if you do decide to include a cover letter, you want to highlight the specialized experience and a tip is if you do put in the specialized experience in your cover letter, please update your cover letter each and every time you apply. Next slide, please. Creating a federal resume. With a federal resume, you want to tell a story. You want to include the beginning, the middle, and the end, as much information as possible. You want to highlight your qualifications. Identify KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Describe your work history. Describe the work, how it was carried out, outcomes of the work, and this is a big one here. You want to include the length of employment, hours work, whether it was full-time or part-time, and salary paid for that position. We do have here five plus pages, but we know if you're starting out in your career, you may not have five pages. But we're really stressing the point of including all of your If you've done something maybe that's outside of your job duties, you still want to include that in your resume. Next slide. Addressing specialized experience statements. Very, very, very important. When I mentioned on the previous slide about the length of employment, that is needed because the HR specialist will look for one year of specialized experience. And they're not able to give you credit if they are not able to tell the length of the employment, the month and year that you started in the position, and at least the month and year that it ended. But with the specialized experience, you want to read the entire statement. Break down the statement into a checklist of items needed to be addressed in your resume. Address each statement throughout your resume using keywords from the statement. Another tip, please do not copy the specialized experience statement and just put it into your resume. You want to highlight your experience and add those keywords so that you are kind of helping the HR specialist to find the information. HR specialists are not allowed to assume anything, so if they can't find it in your resume, they will not be able to give you credit for it. Provide details. Less is not more. Okay. Common mistakes. Failure to answer questions correctly. And by this, we're saying take the time to read the question and make sure you understand the question before you answer. There's a lot of information there. Sometimes there's a lot of questions. And you don't want to rush through. You want to take your time and read it and answer correctly. Because with the eligibility questions, you can disqualify yourself. 
And if you accidentally hit no when you meant yes, once you've submitted your application, really that you would be able to do um, to correct that. Give yourself enough credit when answering the questions. Failure to submit all transcripts for positive, for positions with positive education requirements. I've seen this several times also. Um, you want to just upload all of your transcripts and just include them. I've seen they've attached their transcript and then at the last minute they're trying to correct it and the announcement has closed and there's nothing that can be done. So to be safe, just include all of your transcripts. Failure to address the specialized experience requirements. Again, this is very, very important. You want to make sure that the HR specialist, um, that they're able to see your experience and to show that you are qualified for the position that you're applying for. Lack of details, failure to use keywords. Just put as much information in your resume as possible. It's never too much. We'd rather have more information than not enough. Next slide. Application checklist. There's a few items, a few areas in the vacancy announcement that you may want to just take some time and to review. Uh, most people do not read the announcement from beginning to end. So I just want to go over um, just a few areas that you may want to review before you submit your application. And the first is who may apply. You want to make sure that you're applying to the correct vacancy announcement. If you are external to the federal government, you want to make sure that, in the, that it says that it's open to all U.S. citizens. The next section would be the overview. This section will tell you the open and closing dates, the pay scale and grade, the appointment type. That's very important. If you're looking for a permanent position and you apply to a position that's a temporary it's not really what you're looking for. So make sure that you go to the overview section and just take a look. The salary is also included there and work schedule. Next section would be duties. This is important because you want to make sure that this is something uh, that you want to do. So they will list the duties for that particular position and you just want to take a look to make sure that you're applying for something that you're interested in. The next section, requirements. In the requirements section, this is where you will find the specialized experience statement. So if you don't go to any of the other areas, make sure that you check this out because you will need the specialized experience statement. And it will also let you know if there is a positive education requirement, and they will let you know um, what's needed, whether it's degree, your transcripts, certain amount of credits, all of that information can be found in the requirements section. Section required documents. This will let you know about the resume, what they're looking for in your resume, cover letter, which is optional, SF50s, and, and um, education information. And the last thing would be to the assessment questionnaire. After you've filled out your application, it will bring up all of your information to give you an opportunity to review before you submit. Take the extra time, just a few minutes, to go through to make sure that you've answered the questions correctly. After you submit your application, this is just a tip that I've offered time and time again. Contact the point of contact, reach out and just ask if your application has been received and if your documents are attached. They cannot go over your application, but they will let you know if it was received and how many attachments. And as long as you do this before the announcement closes, you will have time to go back and add additional documentation if something was left out is to check your account for any status updates. Once the HR specialist goes in to review your qualifications, if you are moved forward to the hiring official, your account will be updated and it will let you know. I'm now going to turn it over. Thanks, Tiffany. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Delisa. So I'm going to go into the hiring roadmap, just a little bit more in depth of um, the hiring process. So just to piggyback off of Tiffany, uh, when applying to the position, you should read the vacancy announcement in its entirety. Why the salary ranges, opening close dates, the location, and required documents. You could potentially self-disqualify yourself if you do not uh, provide all of the required documents. And also, um, you could potentially disqualify your own self um, if you do not apply to the announcement that correctly um, fits you. So once you have I, um, and you provide all of the required documents as well as answer the questions. Moving over to qualifications, once your application has been submitted, our HR team will thoroughly review each candidate's documents to determine if they qualify. This process is done monthly. Candidates who meet the qualifications will receive a notification through USA Jobs as well as candidates who do not meet the qualifications. If you are referred, you may be scheduled for an interview. Just, um, just for a note, just because you are referred, it does not mean you will automatically be selected for an interview. So moving over to interviews, um, interviews could take between two to three weeks to conduct after being referred. Um, hiring managers will review the resumes of qualified candidates. If your resume meets the qualifications of the hiring manager needs, the hiring manager will contact you to schedule an interview. Um, just a note, due to the current pandemic, all interviews for right now. Moving over to selections, once interviews have been concluded, the hiring managers will make their selection and they will notify the HR department of that said selection. Once um, the human resources department receives the selection, they will, re will review the selection verbal tentative offer. If the candidate accepts the offer, um, the human resources department will send a tentative offer letter to the candidate. From there, human resources will submit the candidate's information to our CIS department, which is our Census Investigative Services Department, to conduct a background check. Background checks include fingerprinting and also submitting certain required documents. CIS will contact you to schedule a fingerprint appointment, and clearing security could take up to six to eight weeks. However, each case is different. Moving over to onboarding, once the candidate has cleared security, the HR department will contact the candidate to extend a final offer. Once the offer has been accepted, HR will coordinate an entry on duty date, which will also serve as your orientation date. A final offer letter will be sent to the candidate along with instructions on where to find your required onboarding documentation that you will need to fill the Human Resources Department. Once everything has been completed, you'll just sit back and relax until your entry on duty date. From there, I believe we have our questions. Hey, everyone, Lena McNeary. Melinda, can you open the line for questions? Thank you. And at this time, to ask your questions on the phones, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name clearly at the prompt. To withdraw your request, please press star 2. One moment, please, for questions. Once again, star 1 at this time for questions. Thank you for standing by. At this time, we are showing no questions. Thank you very much. Well, without further ado, I will turn it over to uh, John Elton if there are no more questions. Actually, John has disconnected on the line. Right. Yeah, thank you very thank you very much, Operator. My name is Mike Walsh, and uh, I'll take us through the last couple moments. A quick reminder, if you were uh, too shy to, uh, to uh, ask a question in person and you want to do it via the email address, it is email adrm.job.fair at census.gov. Um, please feel free to email us. We have a team of HR professionals that are ready to receive those questions and be able to assist you. Um, all the jobs that we have shown today are posted on USA Jobs. You can be able to search those. Um, and if you have any questions about 
Choose that email address, adrm.job.fair at census.gov. Thank you for taking the time to participate in today's presentation. We hope you gained some perspective and understanding about the roadmap and value stream of the Census Bureau. We hope you come join us on our journey to create a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. That does conclude today's conference. We do appreciate you attending. You may disconnect at this time. Have a great day.